Bismillah. You might want to tilt it forward a little bit. You want to sit back a little bit. Bismillah. Bismillah. Are you using this one too? Yeah. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. So in talking about building a community, I think that that starts with the home. There's the internal component and then there's the external component. Part of the khutbah was the khutbah was you know concentrating on what children need and more specific boys. I was more the internal component. I think as an Islamic community, we put a lot of emphasis on the masajid programs, social services, the services that the masjid can offer. And while all of that is great, and it is definitely um, uh, an important and integral part of building a community. I think that we uh, don't place enough tarakiz, enough concentration on the internal infrastructure of building a community, and that is the homes that are producing the children that are coming out into the communities. So tonight, inshallah ta'ala, I want to focus on, uh, we focus on what children need in terms of, or what boys need in terms of helping them to develop. 
Uh, tonight, inshallah ta'ala, I want to talk about some of the responsibilities that are upon us as parents. Um, I'm going to lead with a statement from Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, and I, and I want us to listen carefully. Like any other speaker, um, the lectures are carefully calculated. Uh, at least I, can, I can't speak for everyone, but I can speak for myself. That every time I come in front of a group of Muslims or a group of people to give a lecture, 95% of what comes out of my mouth has been carefully calculated in terms of research, in terms of reading, in terms of and everything that's put into it. It's not just, oh, I'm giving a lecture tonight, let me just sit in front of you and entertain you. Right? I'm, not, I'm not here to entertain. I think we live in a society of entertainment and you know, celebrity, you know, worship. That that's the society that we live in. I, I don't. I'm not a proponent of that. All right. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala said, "La tukrihu awladikum ala atharikum, fa innahum makhlukuna li zamanin ghayr ziman zimanikum." Ibn Qayyim said, "Do not force your children to follow in your footsteps." Because they were created for a time that is other than the time that you were created for. Very powerful. Our children, for those of us, uh, I was born in the 70s. May not look it, but yeah. I was born in the 70s. That was a different time. My oldest child was born in 2001. You understand? That's almost a 30 year gap. Right? That's a 25 year gap between me and my oldest son. He was not created to live in the time in which I was created. If you guys understand what he meant by that statement. That if we are forcing our children to follow in our footsteps, then we are setting them up to fail because we are preparing them for a time that they were not created to live in. <coughs> if you guys follow him. He said, لَا تُكْرِهُ أَوْلَادَكُمْ عَلَىٰ آثَارِكُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ مَخْلُقُونَ لِزَمَانٍ غَيْرَ زَمَانِكُمْ Do not force your children to follow in your footsteps because your children were created for a time other than the time that you were created for. Other than the time that you grew up in. Uh, he also said, إذا اعتبرت فساد في الأولاد رأيت عامته من قبل آباء That if you consider most of the corruption of children, you will find that most of the corruption of children comes from their parents. Most of the corruption of the children comes from their parents. Most of it. This passage is powerful because it is consistent with an incident that happened during the time of Umar bin Khattab anhu, where a man came to him complaining to him about his son. جَاءَ رَجْلٌ إِلَىٰ عُمَرَ رَضِي اللَّهُ عَنْهُ يَشْكُوا إِبْنَهُ فَأَحْضَرَهُ عُمَرَ وَوَبَّخَهُ عَلَىٰ عُقُوكَ لِأَبِيهِ فَقَالَ الْإِبْن يَا أَمِيرَ مُؤْمِنِينَ أَلَيْسَ لِلْوَلَدْ حُقُوكٌ عَلَىٰ أَبِيهِ قَالَ عُمَرْ بَلَىٰ قال فما هي يا أمير المؤمنين قال عمر أن ينتقي له أمه أمه وأن يحسن اسمه وأن يعلمه كتاب ربي. Man brought his child in front of Umar uh, to reprimand him for his disobedience and his disrespect of his father. So Umar he began to reprimand the child for being disrespectful and disobedient to his parents. And the child, he asked Umar, he said, doesn't the child have rights over his parents? And Umar said, of course he does. He said, so then what are the rights of the child over the parent? Because it's almost like the, this a dictatorship. The parent gets to dictate to me what I am supposed to do and how I'm supposed to obey him. Do I not have rights over my parents? And Umar said, of course. He said, well, what are the rights of the child over the parent? He said that, number one, you choose for him a, a good mother. That when you marry a woman, you're not just marrying a wife. You're marrying a mother of your children. You understand? I think a lot of times we get very selfish. We say, oh, she's beautiful. I want to spend the rest of my life with her. 
but she may not be motherhood material. And so we are bringing children into the world being raised by women that are not necessarily cut out for motherhood. And therefore the child ends up growing along with the parents, right? These children are being raised by parents who weren't actually prepared for parenthood. So they're actually growing and developing as their parents are growing and developing. He said that you choose for him or her a good mother. And you hasan ismahu, and that you give them a good name. And that is because لِكُلِّ مُسَمَّ نَصِيبٌ مِنْ إِسْمِهِ That everyone who has a name is going to have a share or a portion of that name. So we choose. Everything is strategic. Everything is planned, calculated. From the choice that we choose in the woman to marry, and vice versa, the man that you choose to marry, to the name that we give our children, all of it is calculated. Everything. He said, and that you teach him the book of his Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the young man, he said to Umar, he said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, Inna abi lam yaf'al shay'in min dhalika. He said, O leader of the believers, my father has never done any of that for me. He said, Amma ummi, as for my mother, fa innaha zinjiya kanat tahta majus. That my mother was a slave. Right? This is who my father choose, chose to have a child with. Was a slave um, that was a majus, right? Fire worshiper, magian, an idolater. This is who. And you have a, a great influx of Muslim men today who are choosing to marry non Muslim women or choosing to bring children into the world with non Muslim women. Meanwhile, there's an influx of Muslim women in pretty much every community that can't find a husband. Right. He said, as for my name, he said, Amma ismi, Fasamani Jualan, Yani Khansafa. She named me Beetle. Right? These names that have no meaning to them, right? Because of our incessant need to integrate with American society, we are now opting for names that you know resemble the names of the society. You can hold your questions inshallah. Trust me. I want you to engage me. I want you to engage me. I will leave time, inshallah ta'ala, at the end of the lecture for you to engage, inshallah, or to ask questions. And he said, Amma kitab rabbi falam yu'allimni harfan wahidan. He said, As for the book of my Lord, he's never taught me not even one letter from the Quran. So the point that I'm making is that he brought his child to Umar because of the child's disrespect. But then when you look at what he's invested in the child, what could you expect other than what you give him? Someone who doesn't have something can't give what they don't have. If the child wasn't taught his, the book of his Lord, if the child's mother has not reared him to be respectful, if the child doesn't have a good name by which he can actually begin to implement some of the meanings of that name, what can you expect? What do you expect? So we are essentially not investing in the children what is necessary. And then we have these great expectations of them. And then when they fail the expectations that we have from, uh, you know, of them, then we condemn them. And it's like we're slaughtering them twice. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala, I know he turned to the father and he said, he said, Jitta li tashku uquk ibnik wa kad aqabtahu qabla and you aqikuk. He said, you, you brought your child to me to complain to me about his disrespect of you and you know, his disobedience to you when you were disobedient to your child before your child was ever disobedient to you. You were disrespectful to your child before your child was ever disrespectful to you. So the next time we think as parents about reprimanding our children because of their behavior, because of how they act, then you have to look at yourself first and foremost and ask yourself, did I rear this child to act like this? And if you did, then you get exactly what you deserve. And if you didn't, then you know there's some other things that we need to look at. So when we're talking about raising children, the first thing that children need is, uh, or the first responsibility upon us as parents is to teach our children good adab. 
teach them good character. And I don't mean in theory by sitting down with a book and saying this is the character of the Prophet wasallam and this is what you're supposed to do. That's theory. And uh, as, as Einstein said, to do something over and over expecting a different result is insanity. And for years in the Islamic community, we have been teaching books on adab, adab al-mufrad. You know, we've been teaching books on, you know, the Arba'in and the We've been teaching all of these great Islamic treasures, right? Filled with knowledge of Islamic etiquettes and morals and manners. Uh, and all to no avail. We're not seeing this manifest in, in, in terms of our children. I teach at an Islamic studies. Uh, I teach as an Islamic studies teacher at an Islamic school in Delaware, and I can tell you, as a teacher who engages children on a day-to-day -day basis, that it's not manifesting. And you got to understand, like, where's the disconnect? That, and believe it or not, the disconnect is at home, because the parents drop the children off at school and expect us to be the parent. My job is not to be the parent of your child. My job is to build on the foundation that you have already created in your home. That's my job. But teachers spend more time being, you know, nurturers and cultivators and muaddibin in the classroom than we do muallimin in the classroom. We're doing more teaching of morals and manners and etiquettes, basics of Islam that Muslim children should know. We spend more time doing that than we actually do, you know, carrying out or executing our lesson plans. And it's not fair. It's not fair to you who is, you're paying your money to send your children to an Islamic school. And it's not fair to the child because we can't get through most of the curriculum because we're spending so much time trying to correct behavior that should be corrected at home. Um, so Islamic character is uh, the utmost importance to the point that Ibn Qayyim said Man fi khuluq, fi deen. that whoever outdoes you in good character has in fact outdone you in deen because character is deen the character of Islam it is the religion completely alright and albeit there are some Characteristics with our children that are innate, that are just part of their wiring, their biological wiring. Um, some children are just sarcastic. Some children are just, you know, have an attitude. That's some, there's something that's just about them that that is not going to change. All right, but with understanding that, we can begin to influence. And this was taken from a hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu said to one of his companions, Ashaj Abdul Qais, he said, Inna fika khaslatayni yuhibbuhumu Allah al-hilmu wa anat. فقال يا رسول يا رسول الله أقديم هذا أم حديث يعني هذا قبل الإسلام أو بعد الإسلام هذا قديم أم حديث قال بل قديم. He said that you have two qualities that Allah loves. You possess two qualities that Allah loves. He said الحلم وأنا وأنات. الحلم is is to be forbearing, to be tolerant of other people. Right? You have some people who are just naturally like that. They have a high level of tolerance. وَأَنَاتْ And you're very deliberate. Before you make decisions, you weigh pros, cons. You look at all of the angles before you actually make a decision. And he asked the Prophet ﷺ, Did I, was I created like this? Or was this something that I learned and I developed later on? And the scholars extract from that, that behavior, character are two types. There's either that which is part of the biological wiring of the child, part of who they are, and then there's what is known as learned behavior, what they pick up from their immediate environment in the home, what they pick up from around, being around their siblings, and what they pick up from their peers, and what they pick up in the outside environment, meaning home, uh, meaning uh, their neighborhood, school, and, like, and, and etc. So the Prophet Wasallam he said, no, this is qadim, this is something that you had with you. You were created like this. And he said, all praise is due to Allah who has uh, created me with two qualities that he loves. <laughs> SubhanAllah. All praise is due to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, who created me with two qualities that he loves. So we want to be able to have an impact, an influence on the behavior of our children. And that starts with dua. And Ramadan is the month of 
dhikr, the month of dua, the month of recitation of Qur'an, take advantage of the opportunity. One of the great contemporary scholars of Islam, uh, Sheikh Saleh Fouzan, he said, أَنَّ الصَّلَاحَ الذُرِّيَّةِ كَانَ مَحَالَ الْإِهْتِمَامِ لِلْأَنْبِيَاءِ عَلَيْهِمُ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامِ فَهَذَا خَلِيلُ اللَّهِ إِبْرَاهِيمِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ فَإِنَّهُ كَانَ يَدْعُوا إِنْ يَرْزُقُهُ وَلَدٍ صَالِحًا That uh, rectification of children, صَلَاح, ذُرِّيَّة Having righteous children was something that was very important to the prophets and messengers. If you read throughout the Qur'an, you'll find that many of the prophets and messengers made dua for children that were righteous. Not to mention the Prophet ﷺ said that the dua of the parent for the child is always answered. Right? The Prophet ﷺ said, ثَلَاثُ دَعْوَاتْ مُسْتَجَابَاتْ لَا شَكَّ فِيهِنَّ and from amongst these, he said, there are three supplications that will always be responded to. La shakka fihinna, and there's no doubt about that. And one of those three is the dua al walid li walidihi. Is the dua of the parent for the child. Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, he went blind in his youth. Imam Bukhari, Muhammad ibn Ismail al Bukhari, he went blind in his youth. And his mother took an oath. Wallahi, I will not go to sleep ever until you return to my son his eyesight. Until you return to my son his eyesight. She got up every single night and prayed to Hajjud, stood every single night into Hajjud. Until one day she walked into the room of her son and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had returned to him his eyesight. This is the dua of Imra'a Salih, the dua of a righteous mother who's determined to get her child what he needs or what she needs in order to be, you know, successful in life, in order to have the quality of life that they desire for their children. And when you look at our, you know, many of us as parents and we, there's a particular quality about some of our children we dislike. Do we get up at the third of the night and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reconcile that issue with our children? Or do we figure we're going to beat it out of them, right? And a darb, hadha ma yasir. Allah aladheem. Beating the child is number one, not appropriate. Number two, statistically it has shown, it has proven counterproductive. We're not going to beat anything out of any child. What we're going to do is create resentful children that will hate you later on. Because you couldn't find it within yourself to accept that there are certain things about me as a child that are not going to change. When you look at Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, he supplicated for righteous children. He said, Rabbi habali min as Oh my Lord, give me a righteous child. Zakariya, he said, Rabbi habli min ladunka dhurriyatan tayyiba, innaka sami'u dua Oh my Lord, give me from you a righteous child. Dhurriyatan tayyiba, give me righteous children. Innaka sami'u dua You are the one who hears the dua. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to him and gave him who? Who is the son of Yahya. Yahya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ يَحْيَىٰ وَأَصْلَحْنَا لَهُ زَوْجَىٰ Because she was aqeem, she couldn't have children. But because of the dua of Zakariya, constantly begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the scholars say that if you make dua to Allah and He doesn't respond, then فَبْقِ فِي مَكَانِكَ Then remain in your place, right? And continue crying until Allah gives you what you ask for. Be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like a child is with the parent. When you tell your child no, the child keeps continue crying, fall out on the floor. You ever have one of those children, right, in the middle of the grocery store? They just have a, you know, they have a meltdown. They start crying, hollering, kicking, screaming until you finally give them what they want. Be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the same exact way. You want Allah to give you what you're asking for? Kick, scream, cry, keep crying, begging until He gives you. What you asked for. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that we responded to him. And we responded to him and we gave him Yahya and we rectified the situation of his wife. 
All right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about Ibad al-Rahman, those righteous servants of al-Rahman, رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ عَعْيٌ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا Said, uh, they said, O oh, our Lord, give us from our wives and from our children. Those that will be qurrata a'yun, qurrata ayn, that will be the pleasure of our eye, which is a kinaya, which is a metaphor for pleasure. That when you look at them, you are actually pleased and happy with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you. All right? So this is in, in addition to the dua of the parent for the child. So after making dua for our children um, and instructing them with matters of the religion that will play a major role with respect to their healthy relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِسْمَعِيلِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ صَادِقَ الْوَعْدِ وَكَانَ رَسُولِ النَّبِيَّ وَكَانَ يَأْمُرُ أَهْلَهُ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالزَّكَاةِ وَكَانَ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ مَرْضِيَّ And mention in the book of Ismail, that indeed he was صَادِقَ الْوَعْدِ He was someone who was truthful in his promise. وَكَانَ رَسُولِ النَّبِيًّا And he was a prophet and a messenger. وَكَانَ يَأْمُرُ أَهْلَهُ بِالصَّلَاةِ He used to command his family with salah and zakat. وَكَانَ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ مَرْضِيًّا And he was pleasing to his Lord. So it's not just about making dua for righteous children, but after you make dua, you have to put in the work. Right? It's not simply just making dua and then just leaving it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He responds, we have to do the work. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning here about uh, Ismail, that he used to enjoin upon his family the salah. Many of us have children that are at the age where they should be praying, which is 10, at 10 years old, salah is wajib. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Muru abna'akum bis salah wa hum sab'ah. وَضْرِبُوهُمْ عَلَيْهَا وَهُمْ أَبْنَا عَشْرَ وَفَارِقُهُمْ فِي الْمَضَاجِعِ That you should enjoin upon your children to pray at the age of seven. You can't imagine in an Islamic school how many children will tell you they don't even pray at home, nor do their parents. Make no mistake about it, children sometimes they have no filter, they tell everything. Sometimes we have to stop children. No. Don't tell me your family business. Well, my mother doesn't wear hijab, so I should... No, 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 no. We don't want to hear what goes on in your house. They tell everything. But what do you say to a child when the child tells you, I don't have to pray? You say, but you're eight, you're nine, you're 10 years old, 11 years old. I don't have to pray. My parents don't pray. They don't tell me I have to pray at home. What are we supposed to do? How do we, as educators, tell your child salat is wajib when the parents are sending an indirect message saying the salat is not wajib? You don't have to pray. And we're, we're talking about building an Islamic community, a fortress wherein we can protect our children from the demonic forces beyond the walls of the masjid in the Islamic community. And, and this is, you know, what's happening. You know, even some of the uh, Sahaba and many of the Tabi'un and those who came after, they used to give their children rewards as an incentive to do acts of ibadah. Right? It was mentioned that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said, أَنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يَأْخُذُونَ سَبْيَانٍ مِنَ الْكُتَّابِ لِيَكُومُ بِهِمْ فِي رَمَضَانٍ وَيُرَقِبُهُمْ يُرَقِبُهُمْ فِي ذَلِكَ وكان بعض الصرف يعطون الأطفال الهدايا تشجيعية على أداء الصلاة. That Aisha رضي الله تعالى عنها, she said that the Sahaba رضي الله تعالى عنهم, they used to take their children from school, right, and you know allow them to you know fast in the month of Ramadan, right. They would give their children gifts, هدايا تشجيعية. They would give them gifts as an incentive for praying. I mean, like, just think about that. Create with your children a salat chart. If you've prayed all five salat at the end of the week, inshallah, then perhaps we can do this, or perhaps I will do that, as an incentive for them. 
And then as they grow older, you begin to transition their reward from you as the parent to their reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abi or Ummi, you know, you're not giving me any more gifts and I made all of my prayers because my gift giving is over. Your gift now comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not from me. Allah will reward you now. You're old enough now. I did that when you were five, six, seven, eight years old. You're 12 years old. I don't know, I no longer need to give you a gift to pray. You should be able to understand at 12 that you are ma'jur with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're going to be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no gift that I can give you that is greater than the gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you. So, you know, we have to, you know, understand that making dua for our children and joining upon them the acts of ibadah that will help them develop a stronger relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, of course, as parents, making sacrifices. Don't you know that with your good deeds, you can make what is called tawassul. You can supplicate to Allah that, oh Allah, if I did this, or if I made this sacrifice for your sake, then bless my children with this, or give my children this, or protect my children from this. You're making sacrifices for the sake of Allah for your children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said about Ibrahim, he said, فَلَمَّا اَعْتَزَلَهُمْ وَمَا يَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ وَهَبْنَا لَهُ إِسْحَاقِ وَيَعْكُوبُ وَكُلًّا جَعَلْنَا نَبِيًّا وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُمْ مِن رَحْمَتِنَا وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُمْ لِسَانَ صِدْقٍ عَلِيًّا Pay attention to this ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And when Ibrahim began to distance himself from his father and his people and what they worshipped. This was a sacrifice. Sometimes you have to distance yourself sometimes from even from the people that you love because they begin to infringe on your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A true friend, a true family member should complement your journey to God, not complicate your journey to God. You understand? A true friend, a true family member, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Prophet Nuh, إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ مِنْ أَهْلِكَ Your son... It's not from your family. He has deeds that are not righteous. He's not your family. And this was his son. Showing you that sometimes even your own biological family members, you have to draw a line between you and them because they begin to infringe on your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said he's not from your family. Some of us use that as, as an excuse to continue carrying on relationships with people that are family members, even though you know that their relationship with you creates a rift between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes we have to separate ourselves, distance. And sometimes distance, you know, creates a gravitational pull. Sometimes when you distance yourself from someone, they miss you and they begin to realize that the reason why you separated yourself from them was because of things that they were doing and perhaps they will take a look at that. But that was tough, that was hard. Some of us as converts to Islam, we had to distance ourselves from our family members because they weren't respecting our journey to God. We are on a journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We found God, we found Islam. And sometimes family members don't respect that. So sometimes you have to create a little distance from you and them. And, and that's heavy, that's heavy, especially when you grow up in a close-knit family unit. It's heavy. So when Ibrahim began to call his father to Islam, and his, that conversation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Qur'an between him and his father, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَلَمَّا اَعْتَزَلَهُمْ وَمَا يَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ وَهَبْنَا لَهُ إِسْحَقْ وَيَعْكُوبُ Subhanallah. That when Ibrahim distanced himself from his father and his, his family and what they used to worship, that was a sacrifice. Allah said, وَهَبْنَا لَهُ إِسْحَقْ We gave him إِسْحَقْ and يَعْكُوبُ and both of them, we made them prophets. So what I'm saying is that when we learn to make sacrifices for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will repay us through our children. Understand something. Children are your karma. If you don't understand what that means, let me explain. 
everything that you did to your parents, all of the things that we did in our lives, it comes back to us through our children. So when we have that one child that's giving us a headache, and we always have one or two, I fortunately, unfortunately, have about three of them, right, who test me as a parent. But then when I look back at all of the things that I did to my mother, and my mother used to tell me, everything that you are doing to me is going to come back to you. 16, 17, 18 years old, not listening, you know, doing the total opposite. I was raised by a single mother, so that was even worse. There was no father in the home, so my mother's word at some point in my life really meant absolutely nothing to me. And my mother's deceased now, so it's even double the punishment because I don't have any way to make it up. I can't go back to her and apologize. I can't go back and say, Mom, I figured it out. <laughs> I'm sorry, right? I got to live with that. I have to live with all of the crap that I gave to my mother, even though now I know better. But then when I look at some of my children... All of that comes back to you. Man. What you put out in the world comes right back to you. Our actions have a boomerang effect. When you throw a boomerang out, it swirls, and it comes right back to you. Your actions do the same exact thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, وَهَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ It's not the reward of good, anything but good. You do good, good comes back to you. Then in another ayat, Allah says, وَجَزَاءُ سَيِّئَةٍ سَيِّئَةٌ مِثْلُهَا And the reward of evil is an evil just like it. So good and evil, whatever you put out into the world, that's exactly what comes back to you. That is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make no mistake about that. We don't get away with anything. Allah has to make sure that the earth maintains its balance. And the balance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala maintains is to make sure that what you put out into the world is what you get back. So Allah said that when Ibrahim distanced himself from his father and his people and what they worship, we gave him then his haq. Not, don't, not only did we give him his haq, we gave him Yaqub. We gave him a son and a grandson, two generations. And we made both of them a prophet. Two generations. We're struggling with one generation right now, but learning how to make sacrifices that will endure, you know, with your children. So that's, that's that. The next thing that we need to focus on or the responsibility that we have as parents is to make sure that our children have firm belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right now, in this society, there, um, there was a show called Game of Thrones. There, this is the society that is the game of souls. Because that's what you are gambling with. You are gambling with your soul in this environment right here. The Prophet ﷺ prophesied that there would come a time where a man would sell his religion. Essentially selling his soul for a share of this dunya. He said, Yabi'u dinahu. He'll sell his deen for a share of this world. And we know many Muslims who have fallen into that right now. You sold your soul for a share of this dunya. Trying to integrate into this society. Trying to get non-Muslims to in, in, embrace you and welcome you. So we'll accept this group and accept this ideology, accept this belief. Even though we know it contradicts Islam, we'll accept it because we think that this is how we are going to be a part of the fabric of American culture. Sadly, it's really sad, honestly. Because the Prophet ﷺ predicted that this is exactly what would happen. He said, لَتَتَّبِعُونَ سُنَنَ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ شِبْرًا بِشِبْرًا وَذِرَاعًا بِذِرَاعًا حَتَّى إِذَا دَخَلُوا جُحْرُ الضَّبٍ لَدَّخَلْتُمُوهُ قَالَ مَنْ هُمْ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ الْيَهُودُ وَالنَّصَارَ قَالَ فَمَنْ إِذَا لَمْ يَكُنْ هَؤُلَا فَمَنْ He said, you will follow the traditions of the people that came before you. Shibran bi shibran, hand span by hand span, arm's length by arm's length. 
that if they were to crawl into the hole of a lizard, a lizard hole, in modern writing, we have something that's called the rabbit hole. The Prophet Sallallahu used the lizard hole, right? It's a cultural reference to his environment. That if they were to enter into a lizard hole, meaning if they were to engage in behaviors that مَا يُصَدِّقُ الْعَقَلِ That the intellect would never even accept, then you would follow them in it. No matter how absurd, no matter how idiotic, you would follow them. The Sahaba said, who are you referring to, a messenger of Allah, Jews and Christians? He said, who else? Who else would I be referring to? And here we are today, right? Muslims who celebrate Christmas. MashaAllah, tabarakAllah. No, Wallah al I, I laugh to keep from crying. It's, it's that sad. Shay Mubki, Jiddin. Because we are afraid to say, with all due respect, I don't celebrate Christmas. Those few little words. We would rather say, Merry Christmas to you too. Instead of saying, with all due respect, I don't celebrate. Or, you know, enjoy your holiday. I, I, don't, I don't celebrate. But because we can't do that. Because we want, to be comp- we want to be embraced and accepted. But... The, we should focus on the belief system of our children because our children, the difference between our children becoming slaves to this environment and this society and being slaves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is how deeply they are able to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our belief system is connected to our core values. As Muslims, much of what is being lost today through our complete integration into this society when you look at the natural or the predisposition that Allah created us with, every human being was created believing in God. The Prophet Sallallahu said, مَا مِن مَوْلُودٍ إِلَّا يُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ فَأَبَوَاهُ يُهَوِّدَانِهِ أَوْ يُنَسِّرَانِهِ أَوْ يُمَجِّسَانِهِ That there is no child except that he or she is born not Muslim. Stop saying born Muslim. They're not born Muslim. They're born with a predisposition. They are born with a predisposition, pre-exposed to belief in God. Believing in God does not make you a Muslim. Allah says, وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرَهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ Most of them do not believe in God except that they associate partners with Him. So simply believing in God does not make you a Muslim. That is Tawheed al-Rububiyyah. What is expected of you is Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah. That once you recognize that God is there, once you recognize that Allah is omnipresent, omnipotent, and all of the great qualities that we describe Him with, once you recognize that, now you serve Him. That is what makes you a Muslim. Because you make a conscious decision to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not you make a conscious decision to recognize He's there. That's part of your predisposition as a child. All right? So our job essentially in giving da'wah is not to make people believe that God exists, but to make people, because they believe that God exists, understand that there's a responsibility that comes along with that, which is to serve Him. And notice the Prophet ﷺ didn't say that the parents make him a Muslim, because he's already on the fitrah, the belief of Islam, which is the belief in one God. That there's no child except that he is born with a predisposition to believe in Allah, and it is his parents that make him a Jew, a Christian, or a Magian, a fire worshiper. Thus it is the parents' responsibility to ensure that this predisposition does not change. And that we nurture it and cultivate it with correct knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that they have the value system that will allow them to be effective in this society. And not affected by the ills of this society. All right. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he left the legacy of Tawheed with his children, with his progeny. Allah says in the Quran, وَوَصَى بِهَا يَعْنِي التَّوْحِيد وَوَصَى بِهَا إِبْرَاهِيم يَعْكُوب بَنِيهِ يَعْكُوب وَيَعْكُوب إِنَّ اللَّهَ اصْطَفَى لَكُمُ الدِّينَ فَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ And Ibrahim, he left, he advised his family, and so did Ya'qub, his children, 
إِنَّ اللَّهَ اسْتَفَى لَكُمُ الدِّينَ That Allah has already selected for you your religion. فَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ Do not die except in a state of total submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that's what being Muslim is about. Being Muslim is not being peaceful. And I don't want to hurt anybody. And I just want to be accepted. And please accept me. Islam means peace. Stop with the placating the feelings of other people. Stand in your discomfort. Understand some people are not going to accept that. And that's okay. Truth goes through three stages. Number one, it's going to be ridiculed. People are going to call you crazy. They called the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam They called him insane. They called him a poet. Called him a kadhab. They called him a liar. It's going to be ridiculed. The second, is that it is violently opposed. People are going to wage war against you. And here we are today. Islamophobia and Islam being attacked. The hijab, the Muslim woman being oppressed. Muslim men, the misogynistic, patriarchal. To the end of it. It's going to be attacked violently. And then lastly, it's accepted as evident truth. We just have to be patient. We have to be patient until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does what he promised he was going to do. لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كَمَ اسْتَخْلَفَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ That I will root you firmly in the earth just as I gave firmness to those who came before you. And we just have to be patient with that. Alright? Allah says in another ayat in Surah Zukhruf, وَجَعَلَهَا كَلِمَةً بَاقِيَةً فِي عَقِبِهِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ that he left La ilaha illallah, kalimatul baqiyah. He left La ilaha illallah, this concept that our entire religion revolves around. He left this concept with his progeny, with his children. لَعَلَّهُمْ إِلَيْهِ يَرْجِعُونَ So that perhaps they will find their way back. And what that means is that when you give your children a firm foundation of belief in God, even if they deviate from Islam, they will eventually find their way back. They will find their way back. And many Muslim children right now, who are practicing Muslims right now, are living proof. Living proof that if they have a firm foundation, we may not be able to control every single aspect of their life. They may go off to college, they may deviate away from Islam for a particular period of their life. Eventually they find their way back to Islam. Around 25, 26, 27, uh, when life is, you know, starts to become very serious, they begin to now find their way back to Islam. And many of our youth that are now, you know, married and you know, practicing Muslims now are a testament to that. But they have to have a foundation. And he made it an everlasting word. in his progeny, so that perhaps they will return back to it. But if we do not work to give our children a solid foundation, they have nothing to come back to. They have nothing to come back to. They don't have a foundation. Prophet Ya'qub left this legacy amongst his children. Allah captured the final advice of Prophet Ya'qub to his children. A glimpse at the concern of a parent for the spiritual well-being of their children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَمْ كُنْتُمْ شُهَدَىٰ إِذْ حَضَرَ يَعْقُوبَ الْمَوْتِ إِذْ قَالَ لِبَنِي مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ بَعْدِ Were you present at the time when death came to Ibrahim, uh, came to Ya'qub, and he said to his children, what are you going to worship after I'm gone? مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ بَعْدِ What are you going to worship after I'm gone? قَالُوا نَعْبُدُ إِلَهَكَ وَإِلَهَ آبَائِكَ إِبْرَاهِيمْ إِسْمَعِيلُ إِسْحَاقِ إِلَاحًا وَاحِدًا وَنَحْنُ لَهُ مُسْلِمُونَ they said, we will worship your Lord and the Lord of our forefathers. We can see that there was a, a history. This was passed down generation to generation. May not, every generation is not going to embrace it with the same enthusiasm as the generation before it. But the foundation is there. The foundation is there. Likewise, Luqman, السلام, if you look at uh, Luqman uh, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala captures in Surah Al-Luqman a conversation between him and his son. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, that, uh, and remember when Luqman was advising his son, وَهُوَ يَعِذُهُ 
Ya bunayya la tushrik billah. Inna shirka la dhulmul azim. When, remember when Luqman was advising his son and he said to his son, do not associate partners with Allah. I don't care what else you do. You may fall into this, you may fall into that. And the, bad, the door of tawbah is always open. As for shirk, la wallahi. And the, the child will, and I mean like when you look at Muslim children today, they are beyond committing shirk. It's pure kufr. With many children, Muslim children, especially those who go into the college and embrace this, this brand of academia that conflicts completely with the religion of Islam. And they begin to question hard and fast laws and rules of Islam based upon pure intellect. Using their intellect to challenge the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, I don't agree with that. How does a Muslim say, I don't agree with that? As if your intellect is in anywhere near comparison to the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, مَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمَ الْخِيرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ That it is not befitting for a believing male, believing female, that when Allah and His Messenger have decided in a matter that they have any say-so in it. Right? You have women now today say the hijab as a choice. There is no choice. I can choose to wear hijab or not wear hijab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya ayyuhan nabi kulli azwajika wa banatika wa nisa al mu'mineen and yudinina alayhinna min jalabi bihinna. O oh Prophet, say to your wives and to your daughters and to the remaining believing women that they should draw their jilbab over their bodies. This is a commandment to the Prophet ﷺ and his family first and then to the believing women afterwards. Aisha said, Rahimallah al muhajirat al awwal May Allah have mercy upon the migrating women, the early generation of the migrating women that when Allah revealed the ayat of hijab, these women, some of them only had the garment they had on their back. And when Allah revealed the ayat of hijab, they tore the bottom of their garment and they begin to cover their hair with it. SubhanAllah. And today our daughters, our sisters, will have a whole closet full of abaya, right? And say, well, I don't feel like wearing it today. It's my choice. Allah says that it is not befitting for believing male, believing female, that when Allah and His Messenger have decided in a fair, that they have any choice in the matter. So for those that truly believe, they realize, I don't have a choice. And that is what it means to be a Muslim, to submit, to realize that you have free will, but you have now aligned your will with the will of God. Therefore, you don't have free will. You understand? I don't have free will. Yes, I can choose. But when you align your free will with the will of God, there is no freedom of choice. You choose whatever God chooses. Someone asked me, oh, what do you say about gay Muslims? I say exactly what God says. What does Allah say about same-sex uh, relationships? Whatever Allah says, that's what I say. That's the easiest answer to that. I'm not getting caught up in the politics. I'm not getting caught up in you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the debates. I'm not getting caught up in that. Whatever Allah says, that's exactly what I say. No different. Because my will is aligned with the will of Allah. That's what it means to be a Muslim. To submit, to give up living your life the way you want to live it and you live your life according to the laws and guidelines that have been given to you by the one who gave you the life that you live. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, lastly, and we'll end with this one, um, the duty and responsibility of the parent is to teach their children respect for their parents. Uh, it is our responsibility to teach our children to respect their parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed children uh, in the Qur'an to lower their wing of mercy for their parents and to supplicate for them. 
Allah said, وَخْفِضْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الظُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ وَقُرْ رَبِّ رَحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّ يَعْنِي صَغِيرًا And lower your wing of mercy and humility before your parents. And say, رَبِّ رَحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّ يَعْنِي صَغِيرًا Oh my Lord, have mercy upon them just as they raised me when I was little. You think about a child who comes out of the womb of the mother not knowing anything. Allah says in the Quran, وَاللَّهُ أَخْرَجَكُمْ مِنْ بُطُونِ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ شَيْئًا وَجَعَلَ لَكُمُ السَّمْعَ وَالْأَبْصَارَ وَالْأَفْئِدَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ That Allah is the one that brought you forth from the wombs of your mothers knowing absolutely nothing. We didn't have any teeth, we didn't know how to talk, we didn't know how to walk, we didn't know how to feed ourselves, we didn't know how to change ourselves, we didn't know how to do anything. We didn't even know how to go to sleep. We were tired and our mothers had to coddle us and pat us and rock us until we fell asleep. Right? And then this same child turns towards the same parents that taught you how to talk and the same tongue parents. The same tongue that you use to disrespect your parents is the same tongue that your parents taught you how to use to articulate and to explain yourself and to articulate your needs. We are taught to have respect for our parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described Isa alayhi salam who, if you think about it, was a, a single, was being raised by a single parent. The only single parent situation in the Quran is Jesus and Mary. So when we talk about single parents, mothers raising their children, boys being around their mothers and learning how to have respect for their mothers, if, if the mother's a single parent or the father's traveling a lot for work or whatever and the children spend most of the time with the mother, look at the situation of Jesus alayhi salam. Allah describes him, وَبَرًّا بِوَالِدَتِي وَلَمْ يَجْعَلْنِي جَبَّارًا شَقِيًّا That I am dutiful to my mother. This was a child who was brought into the world by a mother without a father. And there are many women who are in pretty much the same situations today. Muslim women who are in the same situations today. They're bringing children into the world and the father is non-existent, non-factor. And those children should learn from the example of Prophet Isa alayhi salam and being dutiful to his mother. Alright? Alam yaj'alni jabbaran. And Allah did not make me jabbar, did not make me someone who superimposes on other people my strength. Um, the children of the Sahaba lived in an environment where they saw kufr, they saw shirk. All right, in its many different manifestations, they witnessed blatant oppression and torture of Muslims, including their own parents. And perhaps them seeing their parents endure these atrocities is what made them cling to the religion with such passion. Um, there's a story that took place during the fitna of Imam Ahmed where Imam Ahmed was put in prison because he would not agree to the belief that the Quran was created. It is the belief of Ahl Sunnah that the Quran is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala مَنْ هُوْ بَدْعَ وَإِلَيْهِ يَعُودِ From Allah it began and to Allah it will return and is not the speech of Allah. Uh, I mean it is not created. It is the speech of Allah that is not created. Imam Ahmed used to say, Kana Isa bikun wa laysa Isa bikun. That Isa was created with the word be, and Isa is not the word be, because Isa is created. And if we said Isa was the word, then that would mean that Allah's speech is created because Isa is created. It's, it's to that point, bidikka, with such precision, the scholars of the past were very diligent in making that distinction. Nonetheless, Imam Ahmed said to his son one day, he said, رَحِمَ اللَّهُ أَبَا حَيْثَمْ غَفَرَ اللَّهُ لِأَبِي حَيْثَمْ So his son said to him, مَا هُوَ يَا أَبَتِي مَا هُوَ أَبُو حَيْثَمْ So Imam Ahmed's son, Abdullah, one day he heard his father, you know, saying, may Allah have mercy on Abu Haytham. May Allah forgive Abu Haytham. And so his son said to him, O oh my father, who is Abu Haytham? And, the, and Imam Ahmed said to him, Abu Haytham, a list. He was a thief, right? He said, "Lama julitu warumitu fi sijin kana fihi rajulun yuqalu lahu Abu Haytham al list." Jaani wa qala ata'rifuni, fa kultu la. Qala ana Abu Haytham al list. 
Kutiptu fi diwana miru mu'mineen Anni julittu Alf thamani miya Marra Wa sabartu ala thalika ta'atan Lish shaitan min ajli dunya Fasbir anta ala ta'ati Rahman min ajli deen Allahu Akbar He said when I was in prison I was lashed I was beaten and I was thrown in prison He said there was a man In the prison with me and his name was Abu Haytham and he was a thief and he came to me one day and he said, do you know who I am? And Imam Ahmed said to him, no, I don't know who you are. And he said, my name is Abu Haytham and I'm a thief. He said, and I was, it was recorded in the legislature of the leader of the believers that I was to be lashed 18,000 times. 18,000 times across my back. He said, and I was patient with those lashes because I was being obedient to shaitan for dunya. He said, but you are being lashed for the pleasure of Ar-Rahman, so be patient for your deen. What I'm saying that to say is that when the Sahaba saw their parents, you know, enduring the torture in Mecca, saw their parents building an Islamic community, it created within them a natural respect for their parents. When our children see us constantly complaining about what the masjid is not doing, how bad the community is, never giving sadaqah, never contributing, you know, volunteering our time. When our children see that, they themselves do not have a respect for the masjid, the Islamic community, and not even us as parents. When they see us making sacrifices for the Islamic community, they learn, they learn subconsciously, they learn to have respect for Islam. Because they see that it's important to us, so therefore they consider it important. So our children having respect for us is not us sitting down telling the children, hey, respect me as your parents. But our children witnessing us, making sacrifices for them, making sacrifices for the Islamic community, and automatically developing a respect for us. You guys follow me? I don't know, am I boring you? Because I, I see some people like, when is this guy going to stop talking? And I usually don't talk this long, so I want to stop here in Shalom Tada. There was a ton of other, you know, issues that we could address, but I'm just hoping that, you know, we, we understand. I'm a parent as well, so I'm talking to myself first and foremost. I don't want to make it seem like that it's I'm teaching you, right? I'm talking to myself first and foremost, that I adhere to these things first and foremost. And... When we begin to implement these things, this is how we build a community. We're talking about the, the internal infrastructure. All right? The external will fall in place once the internal is in place. Right? And it's the same thing as it relates to our individual relationships with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you fear Allah on the inside, you become more conscious of Allah on the inside. You begin to function on a higher frequency of spirituality. The, the external will automatically conform. Say, brother, grow your beard, brother, raise your pants. So all of these other trivial matters of the religion that will automatically fall in place once the person begins to function on a higher frequency of spirituality. But, you know, we want change, right? The external change without the internal change. And it doesn't work like that. It's not how it works. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا وسبحانك ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين. لا أنا لا أعتقد أنه كان هذا جيدا. لا يستحق تكبير. تكبير. الله أكبر. تكبير. الله أكبر. الله أكبر. الله أكبر. MashaAllah, tabarakAllah. No, I don't. I, I just have some information. Whatever you decide to do with it, then Alhamdulillah, hopefully, it's, it's some benefit in it. Uh, yet I have a question. Yes, go for it. Please. Uh, how, how can we, you know, with the teaching of Islam, it's not in the, the uh, Islam is not in the uh, changes from day to day. It's the teachings of the Prophet and the, and the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's something to. to that's good for the, you know, for, for humanity until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at a distance, the end of the case. However, how can we integrate or coordinate as you started the speech by talking about the different time, you know, uh, 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 between the parents and the children, you know, the difference in the, in the era that we live, how we have to uh, consider that in, in raising them. 
Okay, good question. He said, how do we integrate, uh, as we talked about the uh, times, the changing of times, and beginning to imp- uh, integrate, you know, the concept or the idea that times are changing and being able to raise Muslim children in the environments that they are being raised in or, or that they are growing up in uh, without necessarily compromising Islam. That is... Especially when we talk about things that are so odd to us parents, like, you know, being so attached to PlayStation, spend a tremendous amount of time, things like that. With, uh, especially with things like um, the, that, are, that are cultural, the, the, the cultural things. And I mean, it's not just the PlayStation video games, because video games is part of the culture of the society, because in those video games, there are music, there's a certain type of violent behaviors and that, that they see on TV and things like that. So video games, that comes with a whole culture. There's a whole culture, right, of, uh, with the whole video gaming thing. And what it would take for us as parents sometimes is to take some time out of our lives and kind of sit with them and, and learn a little bit about their life from their perspective, right? Don't say, well, though, that's just child stuff and I don't really care about that. Even if I'm not really into playing games, I'll sit and watch just to get an idea of what the game is about and what they're talking about and how the game is affecting them or impacting them and begin to talk to them about it. And you're, you're now, now a part of their world. The worst thing that you can do as a parent is shut yourself out of the world of your children. Because now you don't have a pulse. Now you don't understand. There's a disconnect. Even the language that they use is totally different. When you hear your children using language in the, in the home, like being lit and turn up and all these other terms that they're using, you got to ask them, well, what does that mean? Explain that to me. <laughs> so that you are familiar now with the terms. Like you just can't be completely detached. Because if that's, it, when that happens, then you're not able to watch for certain signs and watch for certain things that, you know, you, you, can't, you can't call it. Because there's a disconnect. So, you know, I think, you know, sometimes as parents, we, ch- we tend to say, well, that's children's stuff. I'm not really into that or whatever the case may be. You don't necessarily have to be into it to understand it. Because understanding it is, you know, uh, you know tantamount to understanding your children and the culture that they're in. There's language barriers. You think about those who immigrated here, they migrated here, and first generation Muslim, their children are Americans. There's a language barrier because a lot of times the, the parents, they learn just enough English just to you know navigate, go back and forth to work and do what they need to do while their children are Americans. You understand? They've had a whole nother culture, you know, aside from the culture that you raised them in. You know, so that's that's important. Wallahu a'ala. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay, so, so so what we'll do, inshallah, is we'll break for Isha, and then the Sheikh can ask answer any questions, inshallah. We'll probably take five, ten minute question, Q&A, inshallah, uh, after Salat al Isha, inshallah. But we'll be over there, inshallah, since he, he does have a flight uh, in the morning, inshallah. What's that? Uh, how many books do you have left? It's about I think I have, whatever was in yeah. the car. So th- there's still a few books that are left. If you're interested, inshallah, see me, and inshallah, we can uh, arrange something, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Once again, we really appreciate uh, Sheikh uh, Shadid Muhammad for, for coming, inshallah. I, I really have high confidence it's not going to be the last time we're going to see him, inshallah. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless him, his family, uh, to guide his footsteps and to keep him firm uh, upon what he's calling for, inshallah. What's that? Inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. So uh, after the salat, inshallah, if you guys have any more questions, there was uh, a question here. Uh, that I would really like to answer. So after the Salah, if you guys have any more questions, pretty much related to the topic, please, uh, then we'll take time out for that, inshallah. Jazakumullahu khayran wa salam alaykum. Yeah, what's kind of going in and out? Jazakumullahu khayran. Excellent speech, Majah. Jazakumullahu khayran. I want to just emphasize on one thing. I'm a physician. We studied psychiatry when I was in medical school. Uh-huh. Behavior, children behavior, all this French education, American education, stuff like that. And what you brought to my attention today for khutbah and Juma and right now, it complements everything, mashallah. We have better than what the society, yes. Western society. We have better to yes. make stronger men for the future. Yes. We 
just have we just have to open the books. Correct. Make Muslims read again. Yes. You're right. Go back to the books. Yes. Go back to the source. Yeah, it's recorded.